What's up, Bass? <clears throat> What's up, guys? Bass Quest here, and today we're going to do something that we haven't done in a long time, and that is a map study. What's up, guys? Bass Quest here, and today we're going to do a wintertime map study on Lake Chickamauga. It's been a long time since we've done a map study, and it seems like that's some of the content that I've done that people really resonate with, and I'm constantly getting messages asking me to do that again. And so today, back by popular demand, we're going to do a wintertime map study. This will help you right now find and locate the fish that you want to catch on Chickamauga Lake. So here we go. All right, boom. So one of the things you have to realize with Tennessee River lakes or reservoirs in general is that you'll have a drawdown in the wintertime on a lot of these lakes. Now, lakes like Watts Bar have a really big drawdown. In other words, there's, you know, they draw down a lot of feet, maybe, you know, 10, 15 feet, whereas Chickamauga is like seven feet and Gunnersville, I think they only draw down uh, maybe three feet. Nickajack is kind of like a tidal fish or he actually goes up and down daily. So in the wintertime on Chickamauga, and we're already there now, the water is it's about a foot away from being true winter pool, but we're pretty much there. And what happens is that a lot of these fish, as the water falls, you can see we've got these shallow flats right here. All right, I'm going to point this couple up here. Boom. This is shallow water. You can see this darker blue. If I zoom in, you can actually see the, uh, the feet on there. So that's four foot, five foot. And this is based off of summer pool elevations. As you can see, we're running the Navionics web app. It's a really good way to do some online research before you get to a fishery. So it's something you need to be very aware of and very careful of when you're running on Chickamauga Lake. If you've got Navionics, if you've got base maps from Garmin um, and some of the other manufacturers, I think that C-Map and Lake Master, if I remember correctly, are the only ones that let you do a water level offset and maybe some of the uh, higher level, like the paid maps on the Navionics and the uh, Lakeview. So just keep that in mind. If you have a base map on here, in this case, if you were running this Navionics, you would have to understand that you could run in this area, but you could not run in this area. So that five foot would be dry land, but this, let's see, nine foot right here would be like less than two foot of water. And the seven foot would be inches. Okay, so you could really bang up your props. These are hard bottom areas a lot of times, all these outside uh, shell bars and you're going to have like shell and rock and stuff so you can knock a lower unit straight off of there and ruin your entire fishing trip in just a heartbeat so that's something to keep in mind so with this water down low what's awesome about it what i love about it for wintertime fishing is that it congregates the fish so a lot of this water is no longer usable water so probably a really good um, way to show this would be to run up river because you have up river you have a lot um, shallower if you look at this see how the backwaters are very shallow on average you know the deeper parts of this is moon slough right now deeper parts are in the 10 foot range mud creek the deeper areas are in the 12 to 15 foot range so if you take away seven foot from that all you've really got is like a small channel in most of these areas like Gillespie, you can see all these backwaters. This is what you watch if you're watching tournaments on Chickamauga, you know, John Cox, when he's up there, you know, flipping for uh, you know, throwing a weightless Cinco and throwing a swim jig for spawning fish and Chad spawn fish. He's back in these kind of areas. All right. But in the wintertime, those don't play. So all the fish that are in these upper water back areas or even in the back areas on the middle of the lake. So if we go down here, look at this size of this flat right here. None of that, or for the most part, most none of it at all is viable water for the fish during the winter months. So what it does, it forces those fish to find new areas to inhabit so that they can find stable water. In a lot of cases, um, that's going to be the actual main river channel. And so what I tend to look for uh, if I'm wintertime fishing and I'm thinking about where I want to uh, find these fish, I'm going to look at, first of all, if I zoom out here, bends in the main river channel if you look at this light colored blue all right that's our main river channel that's the original channel before this uh, reservoir was flooded and became lake chickamauga this is the tennessee river right here all right these bends if you think about it that current will impact along those bends there so it's gonna push up against the sidewall of the bend and it'll 
it'll create a flush. In other words, it'll push more current in that area. And it'll also, when you have current um, pushing up against something, so in this case, you know, the 45 degree or so uh, wall of that channel, what will happen is it'll push water back and it'll create an eddy. The same concept applies if you're trout fishing on a stream and you've got this boulder sitting right here. So you've got a teardrop shape. So say the boulder's right here. The hat's the boulder. How about that? Boom. All right. So in the front of this, where the current is coming, let's say the current's running this way, it's going to form a bubble. And that bubble is going to form back and it's going to trail off like a teardrop or a comet behind the hat. So most people think about fishing this area. If the current's running this way right here, they think about fishing the area on just the back side of this rock right here. But there's actually the most aggressive fish often are on the front side of this. And that's why um, during the summertime, oh, hold on, <laughs> during the summertime, a lot of, let me get back to it here. These fish will sit on main lake islands. Let's run and find one. All right, this is low key island right here. So when you're fishing these underwater islands, these summertime ledge fishing spots, rarely do you see anyone fishing the backside of it. Most of the time, they're fishing the front. That is the front side of the eddy. That's where your most aggressive um, fish will be located. So the concept applies when we're talking about a bend in the river channel. The same thing applies right here. As the, as the current pushes up against this sidewall, this real steep sidewall, it's going to push against it and push out and create a dead water space. That allows those fish to draft current, not work very hard, and to look up and out which is a lot of what these fish are going to do all winter long. They're going to be looking out there for these balls of shad to be pushed down the main river edge. Because as it gets colder, especially if we actually have prolonged winter temperatures, um, what will happen is a lot of the fish that are in the shallower backwaters, which wait, they will stay back there, you know, in that zero to 10 foot range. If we have stable water that's in maybe the mid 40s to 50s. But if we get prolonged cold temperatures, what will happen is those areas, those backwater areas, such as like this secondary channel would be an example, or this pocket that will have a little bit of water in it. You know, these kind of areas are going to have a lot of bait fish in them. Now, if we get prolonged cold, what will happen is those areas might drop down very quickly to, you know, 30s, high 30s, like 38, 39 degrees. And that's very difficult for shad, especially threadfin shad, but even gizzard shad struggle a lot once you get into the low 40s and high 30s, big time. You'll start to have a shad kill. So what they'll do is they'll pull out to the main river channel. And in the case of the Tennessee River, um, you can see we have a lot of deeper water. But if I go up to the very top, let's, let's look at Watts Bar Dam. Look how deep the water is right here. All right. If you look right here. 76 foot, sometimes even 80 foot. All right. So when this water is getting pumped out of these turbines right here, it's getting pumped from that very deep pool on the other side of the dam. So it's very deep, very stable water. And then it's getting oxygenated as it goes through the turbines and pushed down. So as it feeds down the river, what you'll notice is that the, the main river temperature, I'm way over here. All right. <laughs> the main river temperatures, there we go, boom, are going to stay relatively stable. Um, what you'll, especially at, as you go higher in the river system, um, they're going to stay a little bit higher, you know. So even if it's brutal cold, brutal cold for a week, a week and a half, the main river temperature, um, say north of 60 Bridge right here, it's very rare that you see the surface temperatures get below about 44, sometimes 42. And then the actual temperature below that, the ambient temperature below that surface temperature, if you drop something down and read that, it's very stable. It's going to be upper 40s um, most all of the time. Now, as you get to the very bottom end of one of these rivers, that'll change slightly. So say we're talking Harrison Bay. It might be a little bit cooler down there, but it's still going to be much more stable, much more warm water. And it's got the oxygen and it's got the plankton that the shad and a lot of other bait fish want. So a lot of different bait fish are going to pull out there. It's not just shad. It's going to be um, crappie. It's going to be white bass. The crappie and the white bass are going to chase the shad out there. And I noticed that a lot of big bluegill 
it seems like as we get that drawdown, one thing that happens is the grass will start to die out. And so you'll have these last little strands of grass. And as soon as they, you know, turn brown and they're no longer viable, what will happen is the bluegill and your panfish um, species will pull out there as well. So basically for the, you know, apex predators of the river system here, everything that you want to eat is now living on these outside edges but not all outside edges are created equal. Like we said, the bends in the river channel are extremely important, but other key areas to target and to look at are one, warm water discharges. Most of all these Tennessee river lakes and a lot of river lakes in general have not only turbine systems, which would be the top of the dam. So we have, boom, this is gonna be around the turbines, this is going into Nickajack Lake, around these turbines here is always going to be stable water. It's going to be highly oxygenated and it's usually going to cycle in a very small area. And it, there'll always be fish there and they'll always be biting. These fish right here are the least susceptible to major cold fronts and weather changes. All right. And lake level changes for that matter. All right. The next least susceptible fish to any kind of changes are, let's see where I'm at here power plant fish. So you've got warm water discharges, um, power plants, nuclear power plants, all up and down the Tennessee River system and a lot of other systems. Where these things generate and where they push out warm water, it's almost always on the main channel. So you've already got stable water and you combine that with the warmer water that gets pushed out of there regularly. And what you're going to find is that a lot of fish are going to hang out around those areas. The bait's really going to love it. They're not as susceptible to major cold fronts and such. All right, so now beyond that, the next group of fish that I'm going to be looking for when I'm talking these main river drops and stuff like that is going to be the fish on the bends, which we already talked about the bends and stuff. But those fish, because they are in the stable water, they are going to be not as susceptible to all these changes and fluctuations. They can slide up and down in the water column depending on how cold it gets, and they can always look up and out for the things that they want to eat. So beyond that, what are we looking at now? What is another drawing area that's going to pull or congregate the bait, which is going to congregate the fish that we want? That's going to be ditch mouse and creek mouse. So you can see we're right across from a sequoia discharge here. This is coming out of Skull Island area. And these little ditch mouse, you know, it, it, you could technically call that a creek mouth, but there'll be a lot of different ones that come out and where they meet this main river edge is always going to be a key area. Now we can extrapolate that. So say here, this is Saudi Creek. This is a major Creek. It's a little bit different than one of these smaller branches. But if you look here, see how narrow that Creek channel is as it pushes out. These are going to be key areas where fish are really going to stack up. And the same thing applies when you go up river, when you go up river here, then you've got a lot of smaller tributaries like this. This is, I believe that's Mud Creek. Yeah, that's Mud Creek. All right. So if you look at that one, see how small that is? That little outlet right there, everything as it funnels in and out, especially if you're getting uh, warm temperatures and then cold temperatures and then warm temperatures, which we've had a lot in the Southeast the last few years um, where it'll get really warm, you know, like in the 60s. For a few days and it's back down into the 20s and 30s we're in one of those cold dips right now where it's back down super cold and so as soon as it gets warm a lot of the bait and a lot of the uh, fish will flood into here into these backwaters and then as soon as it gets cold again and it gets uncomfortable they're going to push right back out again and get in the current so these are likely areas um, that you're going to find these fish now one trick i will give you is that a lot of times when you're fishing these smaller ditch mouths where they meet the main channel. A lot of guys fish right at the mouth itself and there's always going to be fish there. Don't get me wrong, but don't ever discount that 50 to 70 yards leading up to that mouth and the 50 to 70 yards leading down from it. There's something special about that. And I think what it's, I personally think that it has to do with fishing pressure. Um, I think that those fish get pounded on so much on those small mouths and, and small areas, those isolated areas. If we go back down, the same thing on Major Creek Channel. Let's look at uh, yeah, Sail Creek. Yeah, Sail Creek, where it flows out. 
these fish are so used to getting harassed around these actual mouths that what you'll notice them doing, and they do the same thing on ledges in the summertime, like, you know, the island over here, they'll start to slide up and away. They'll slide up the ledge and out of range of a lot of anglers that are fishing for them. And they'll slide down. And the same thing applies with uh, just about any structure along. So one thing that you'll notice on these uh, flats here in the wintertime is you'll have uh, duck blinds and stuff like that. Or maybe there'll be exposed brush um, that somebody had dumped in there. And now the water's low enough that it's actually exposed and creating a current break. You would think in that case, like if I went right over here and I saw a duck blind, you would think fishing or flipping right onto the duck blind would be where you're going to catch your fish. But that's rarely the case for whatever reason. Most of the time, those fish are going to be like 10 to 15 up feet above it or like 10 to 15 feet below that structure. And that applies all the way across the board to any of these circumstances, which is just interesting to me. Let's see. Other things to look for, viable patterns for wintertime fishing. These flats are still going to play, especially flats that have a deeper secondary channel. Cell Creek is a great example of this. So where it comes out of the main creek here, the main creek arm, you can see here, this lighter colored blue, this is the main channel. But we've also got some lighter colored blue here. So if we zoom in, there's a secondary creek channel that pushes up. So when we have a lot of current um, during the summertime, the water would flow across the whole flat. But in the wintertime, on the upper ends of these flats, it's so shallow that the water, it's some of it's dry land for one, and then some of it's so shallow that the water from the current in the main river can't even wash over it. So in that case, what will happen is it'll come down here and it'll cycle through these creek mouths and actually push backwards up these secondary channels a lot of times. Another example of that on this lake is, let's see here, right across from Chester Frost. Boom, Chester Frost. Here we go. You can see this secondary channel that leads like from Harrison Bay area all the way to the backside into Paradise and, and Hideout Slough and all those places. But these secondary channels, the, the current will flow through them. And a lot of fish will just hang out in these areas, whether it's long tapering points, such as this one right here. Oh, man. Leading into uh, Paradise. Or it can be the little bends and pocket mouths along those areas. So you can see there's kind of a trend here. We're looking for areas that the, the fish can slide in and out quickly. Now that doesn't mean they won't be in inches of water because in the right situation, sometimes even in the extreme cold, like you'll get there and it'll just be a brutal, brutal cold morning in the twenties. And you're thinking, okay, these fish are going to be set up, you know, suspended out. They're going to be deeper on one of these lips, maybe main lake on one of these areas. And what you find out is the first cast that you make up into the dirt, you make two cranks and you catch a fish. So sometimes because that water tends to be more stable and if the water is able to flow, that stable, warmer water is able to flow into those shallow areas, the fish will pull right up into it and the bait will pull right up into it as well. So you got to keep them honest all the time. There's a lot of, you know, misinformation when it comes to this, as far as, you know, the fish get out and they get dormant in the winter time and they get tougher to catch. Like some of the most aggressive um, feeding frenzies I've ever seen, some of the most ag aggressive top water activities that I've seen have been in the winter, um, especially the last few years with me uh, fishing those big live gizzard chad all throughout the winter. It is amazing some of the things that I've seen and some of the places that these fish get and you would just never expect it. Like if you read every article of Bassmaster Magazine, it's not going to help you at all for some of these fish, which is just super exciting to me. Live scope is another thing that's really showed me a whole lot about what these fish do. And it's just wild. And I can get into more detail and depth on that in, in another video. But anyhow, back to the matter at hand. All right. So another pattern. So we've already talked about, or we've kind of covered main lake. We've covered um, discharges from nuclear plants. We've covered turbines, you know, discharges from below the, the dams. We've covered main channel bends and we've covered the key spots on those main channel bands being ditch mouths and creek mouths. All right. So another thing, we're going to do our last little deal main lake right now. All right. And that is going to be bluff walls. 
Uh, this is a really good example of a bluff wall. If you're looking at it strictly from a mapping perspective, um, you can see this really dark part. You know, obviously the uh, yellow is is ground. You know, that's a uh, bare land. And then this black area, it almost looks black because the contour lines um, from the topo are so close together, that's indicating it's almost a vertical drop, whereas this is indicating a very steep drop. So it, it's not quite a 90, maybe this is a 70 degree drop. And then as you go over here, you know, you get more into a 45 degree drop. So in these vertical areas like this, bluff walls can be fantastic. Um, during the winter time. And one of the things that you'll notice about bluff walls on a lot of the river systems is that they tend to be in those key areas, like we were talking about, the outside bends of the main river channel. So it's in that river channel bend. But the cool thing about bluff walls is you have vertical structure. Now, a lot of these ledges that we're talking about fishing uh, along the edge, they are actually bluff walls that are just submerged. But the cool thing about um, having a bluff wall that actually you know, protrudes out of the water and creates, you know, one of these limestone faces that we see running up and down the lake is you get these really neat transitions and the transitions are obvious. So you'll be transitioning from this limestone bed to chunk rock and then oftentimes to shell because of all the current and what's been washed up into those areas. Now these transition areas, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about these areas right here. All right transition areas like that can be phenomenal where fish can slide up and down and use those as a feeding area and it's just something to always keep an eye on whether you're you're running a crankbait or an alabama rig and that, that's another thing if we want to talk about baits so we, we've talked about all these different main lake structures now and different main lake areas that we can target and find these fish what would i target those fish with well a lot of those fish are going to one, they're going to be pushed right up on that edge or they're going to be slightly suspended out. You'll see that a lot where they'll just, depending on the current and the water levels and stuff, they'll slide in and out. And a lot of times when they slide out, they'll suspend. So we need baits that can cover that water column and can also pull the fish because these fish are used to sitting there, drafting current, look out and up and know right where these fish are. All right. So they can go and they can ambush bait. All right. So. I'm going to throw something that's really good for that. Maybe a mid column bait, an Alabama rig, a single swim bait on a jig head, like a hollow body, maybe a true bass. Um, I'm going to throw a downsized Alabama rig, which is a big thing this time of year. Um, Scott over at hog farmers making an awesome one right now. Now you can get the tactical flex rig. The mini rig is amazing for this with running 2.8s and maybe 3.3s is your back bait. Um, the other one is the BFL flex rig. That's the one, and it's a five wire. That is a phenomenal little rig, and I'll probably do a video on that But coming up. But that's those downsized rigs can be phenomenal for those fish that are pressured and they're used to looking out and up. Now, another great bait to throw is actually go big, you know, throw a big swim bait, like a, a glide bait, where you can keep it up in the water column and pull those fish out, a jerk bait. Um, especially uh, like my favorite for fishing these edges and these structures that we're looking at here. Cause a lot of times your boat's sitting in maybe 20 to 35 foot of water and you're firing up into almost nothing. So I feel like as it works down this edge, as you pendulum your bait basically down the edge, when it comes to jerk baits, I like a mid diver. So a vision 110 plus one, a uh, jackal re-range uh, mid runner, mid diver. Those are phenomenal jerk baits to kind of get in that little zone and catch those fish. Another great thing, especially for bluff wall transitions, or if you've got an area that's um, harder bottom, it's not just a mud bend on the main river channel, is a crankbait. Um, shout out to Matt Allen, Tim Little, Tactical Bass, and they've made a bunch of great videos on speed cranking. That's something that's been going on um, in the Southeast for years and years and years. Now they've uh, refine that to their own version of it using a little bit bigger crankbaits. Here in the South, it's always been popular um, to throw a smaller version of that when you're burning a crankbait, whether it's a wiggle wart. Um, nowadays, a rock crawler is one of my favorites. Bandit 200, Bandit 300. Just those smaller, we call them a uh, small body crankbaits. Um, so that's a great way. And those things run usually between somewhere around six to 12 feet, DT8, DT10. Those are perfect 
um, to target those fish because a lot of times those fish, they're not sitting deeper than 14, 15 feet most of the time, whether they're suspended or whether they're up against the edge. So that's a great way to target them. Um, another thing, another bait that I would use to target these fish would be a jig because when you're starting to work down these areas, especially a bluff wall, you're going to run into wood. And so having a finesse jig with a finesse trailer on there is a phenomenal way to target those fish and have a slower presentation. I also use a Texas rig if I really want to downsize and I'll just put a small unobtrusive plastic on there. One of my favorites is a zoom speed crawl, just a regular little ultra vibe speed crawl, natural color, really lightweight Texas rig. And the jig and the Texas rig, I'm not fishing on heavy line. A lot of the stuff I'm doing this time of year, even my Alabama rigs, I'm throwing on like 15 pound test. I'm trying to keep that line diameter lighter so that I can work the bait more naturally in the current for one, but also draw those strikes. A lot of times we tend to get a lot cleaner water that time of the year. So it's important to be able to draw that bite, especially from that big fish. Even my glide baits, I'll, I'll run like 20 pound fluorocarbon on those. Let's see here. I'll give you a couple more finesse ones. Um, and these are techniques that are not really often thought of as a Tennessee River technique. It's more of a Highland Reservoir technique. One is tight lining. Um, so tight lining on a Highland Reservoir, like it's popular on Cherokee Lake, Norris Lake. And they'll take a small crappie jig, like a little Bobby Garland on a, you know, an out an eighth ounce head, maybe a three sixteenths or three thirty seconds ounce head, just a very lightweight little crappie sickle hook. And they'll throw it out there on super light line, maybe four pound test. And you throw it out and you pendulum it down one of these breaks right here. Okay. You, you pendulum, you throw it and you're just slowly reeling it and barely twitching your rod tip. You want that rod tip to just barely be twitching as you're reeling and it hovers and pendulums directly down that break right there. And it's just, something that gets those fish going now uh, another version of that is a float and fly it's something you know a float and fly is basically like if you've ever crappie fish with a jig and a float it's pretty similar to that um, it's a lot more refined in a lot of ways to, in order to catch big bass and things and also to fish deeper i typically use a slip float on mine so that i can adjust the depth without having to have like a custom eight foot rod um, i usually use a seven six like a two power medium light it tends to be my setup um, but you can run below that cork, you know, you can run yourself a jig or in my case, a lot of times I use an upsize crappie minnow, which for me is a zoom tiny fluke or a gulp three inch minnow. And I actually use a gulp three inch minnow or a zoom tiny fluke for my tight lining as well. So you can imagine it's just slightly upsized from what people would normally use um, for those pan fish and for smallmouth on Highland Reservoirs. And I've caught giant ones doing this, guys. I'm talking like six to eight pounders in these same areas that we're talking about, especially if the water's clean, especially if you've got a cold front and things are tough out there, you can pick that up. I personally still like to use light line. When I am using a float and fly, I wanna be around that six pound test. If I'm around really big fish, like I'm super confident with Sunline FC Sniper, seven pound leader, I'm super confident I can land anything in the lake on that. Um, now, if I'm doing the tight lining deal, I'm going to go monofilament and I'm going to go down to four pound test. And I'm super confident if with, with an ultralight, you're talking like a trout set up zero power rod. Um, I would, I prefer it to be longer. Um, I feel like you have a lot more leverage. You get a better hook set and you get a better play on a fish with super light line when you have a longer ultralight. So seven, six minimum but I would prefer to see that ultralight and like that seven or sorry, six, six minimum seven foot is where I would like to see it for a zero power ultralight rod. And I'm sure you could do this with some of your BFS stuff as well, but I haven't really ventured into that genre yet. All right. So now last but not least, we're going to talk about some of the uh, fish that are resident in the creeks. Now, some of these major creeks, you know, especially like uh, Chester Frost, we'll just use that as an example. A lot of these areas, what you'll find when they have a deeper creek and a big area like this, if you look at this and we cut this off right here, Chester Frost alone is the size of a good size lake. All right. And a lot of times what these 
areas will fish like is their own individual body of water, especially as you get further down away from the very top end of a reservoir, the north side of the reservoir, down to the lower end. Um, as you get down there, you start to lose some of the effect of the current. As you can see here, the, the lake is so wide that a lot of these areas, especially like Harrison Bay area, where the, there's a channel over here, some of this stuff is just not really affected all that much by current. So if you got a day that's like a light current day, maybe a weekend or something, and they're not going to be running good current, some of these fish upriver might not bite well, but some of the fish in these wider, lower flow areas can bite really good because sometimes it's just based off a of wind current. So when I get down into these areas, I'm going to be looking for birds, guys. Um, in the wintertime, I tell you, Probably some of the best guys that I know of that target birds and probably the best at it is going to be the, the Wishing I Was Fishing Boys. Like when you're talking Dylan Filardo and Tanner Hustep, like those guys know how to chase birds and that's what they do. They, they, they sit around the low end and they know exactly what to look for. The birds that are not just diving on loons, the birds that are not just, you know, fake diving in order to get ready for a roost. Like you, you have to know what you're looking for when these fish or the birds are diving in like a five gallon bucket and just plowing into one area. And you got to get up right on plane right then and run to them and you can catch these fish. Now, sometimes they'll be going out in the middle of nowhere, guys. Like th there will be nothing there, nothing beautiful, nothing, no structure, you know, like not on a little edge like this or out on a hump. They'll just be in no man's land and the birds will start diving and get out there. And like the fish that you want to catch are just suspended under these birds and you can wear them out. Um, a lot of times the catalyst for that is striper, whether it's white bass or true striper, these fast fish and birds such as loons, loons are super fast. They're able to corral bait in these areas and the bass will take advantage of that. The catfish will take advantage of that. The slower predators, they'll get under those and kind of join in with the crew there. And as, as long as those other fish can, and birds can keep those, bait pinned up and corralled, they've got a great little feeding frenzy that they can go through there. So following birds in these do nothing areas and in the back of these major creeks can be huge. Um, beyond that, what you'll notice in the winter time is a uh, shout out again to uh, tactical bass on this one. Um, they're the ones that taught me this is that these fish in the winter time, they'll get on do nothing bottoms, like in, in the backs of these flats, where there's hardly anything going on. Now, Chester Frost has a little bit of structure, but in a lot of these areas, if you get up here in the shallow water on these high spots, there'll be hard bottom. And we associate that as bass anglers with, you know, good fishing, hard bottom shell beds, that's good fishing. In the wintertime, when there's no current in some of these backwaters and it's just wind driven stuff, a lot of times these fish will just get out into these mud flat areas like there's hardly any contour there's really nothing on the bottom to hold them there. there's no stumps there's not many trees there's hardly anything it's just kind of like a, a low spot in the backs of these areas and for whatever reason they'll hang out there and they'll congregate in those areas but what you'll notice is it'll be close to an area where they can pull up and and actively feed okay and it'll also be in an area where the wind naturally or what little current is in that area will naturally cycle the bait to them. So that's the catalyst. Like they don't want to be cruising around. A lot of these fish are not, even though we do have like nomadic pelagic style fish in these lakes, a lot of them, you know, they're not interested in covering miles and miles and miles. Now they might cover miles and miles because they never stop swimming, especially big ones. They don't stop swimming but they're going to cover it in a small area. Like they'll have their own little house and the backs of these creeks can be a great place to look as well. Um, and then of course the, the very last couple points as you're coming out of any of these creeks can be really good, not just where it meets the main river channel. So you can keep those fish honest. If we have a few warm days or if, you know, the bait starts to congregate in the middle of nowhere, you can find them on these, little secondary areas as well. So now we've covered what to do main lake. We've covered what to do on flats. We've covered what to do in all these different situations and in the creeks. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think of the last bit of advice that I would give to you. Um, one important thing for me is I'm always looking at the flow and I'm looking at the water level 
Um, changes in water level can make a big difference when you're talking about fish that are not directly on the main river channel. So if I'm planning on fishing for fish that are on flats or in the backs of creeks, uh, a lot of times the water level changes can affect that bite a little bit more. If I've got an extreme weather event that comes through, maybe I've got a lot of dirty water that's pushed into the fishery. Like we had a huge rain the other day um, over the weekend and now we've got a big cold front. So that's kind of a recipe for tougher fishing, right? We've got cold, dirty water. Um, so I need to focus on areas where the fish are not typically suspended and where I know they're going to get directly on something that I can fish. So in that case, I'm going to be fishing a lot like below a dam in tail raises because I know right where those fish are going to be. Like they don't have anywhere else to go. They're going to get up on these uh, banks where I can crank them or they're going to get right around the turbines around the actual dam structure or big man-made structures in that area and I can fish for them. Same thing applies if I'm fishing the main lake. You know, uh, when we're talking about bluff walls right here, that's a great place to target when the water's dirty. Um, pull out a big spinner bait, pull out a uh, crank bait and target those areas where those fish will suck directly up onto there. And then the other thing that I do in that case, if I am getting that dirty water is I'm going to flip, I'll flip wood down these same kind of areas and areas down the main river edge and on the bends, I will flip those as well. But that's, that's just a really good starting point for you. Again, that's going to be more stable water. Remember guys, more stable water, warmer water, is going to be out towards the channel when you have current okay it's going to be in that deeper zone so if if i do get a major cold front or i'd get that cold muddy water i'm going to be focusing more main lake now guys i hope that you've had fun with this video it's been a long time since i've done it i hope this is good information for you and i know that if you kind of follow some of these tips that i've just shared with you in this little presentation it's going to help you find the fish that you want to catch those bigger than average fish you know those those ones that have that row that are starting to fatten up for the winter time it's time to go chase trophy fish it's time to chase numbers of better than average fish and what i just shared with you is going to get you well on the way to locating those fish now it's up to you to get out there and catch them and i can tell you based off of the you know my experience with the live bait um, the last few days and last year about this time i mean they are out there guys i'm telling you um, i've got live scope now and i've gotten really good with it you know i can tell within a pound how big these fish are a lot of times and some of these little stretches that you know you fish down or some of these mouths they might have 15 to 20 fish over 10 pounds sitting on them and they're bass and like we catch some of them and then a lot of them over eight. So they're there. A lot of guys, you know, it's we're on Chickamauga Lake. There's a lot of fishing pressure on this lake. And I know that a lot of people are getting discouraged about that, um, especially if they're you know running out there with artificial baits. And my encouragement to you would be that the fish are there. Now, they are educated, so you can't expect necessarily to break out the uh the tools, the same tools that you did lure wise and, and technique wise as you did maybe two, three, four years ago. Now, you know, we, if we think of this as an arms race, right? So there's more people fishing on the water than ever. So these fish are interacting with more people than ever. And because of that, because of this, you know, larger segment of the population that is fishing recreationally out here, um, these lure companies have more money. They're creating better and better baits. And so the fish are seeing more baits. And so this, the rate of this arms race is increasing. It's got an increasing curve on it. I actually had a conversation with Matt Allen about this the other day. We kind of had a long conversation nerded out about this, but just the, uh, the velocity of this arms race, the velocity of the way the fish are learning because fish learn generally generationally. And we've been preaching catch and release for years and years and years. So that generational knowledge is being passed on very well through the gene pool of those fish. And so we're educating them at a faster rate and they're getting more education because there's more fish that learn it and live than ever before. And I think, um, you know, California was kind of the start of all that. And so now a lot of their fisheries have turned into finesse fisheries. A lot of the fish are extremely difficult to catch and you're starting to see that more 
in the southeast now. It's just a natural progression of things. So it's really important, guys, and I encourage you to follow um, really good anglers um, for for good tips. One, I, I, you know, for new techniques and new things to use. All right. Tactical bassing is a great example of that. Uh, Millican fishing is a great example of that. But I also don't want you to discount the stuff that no one uses anymore because that's another key, right? Use things that have been used in the past, but nobody even touches anymore because there's the new shiny thing over here. Randy Blockett has a bunch of great videos. And I know there's like a whole lot of drama going on between like the Randy Blockett group and the Millican group and stuff like that. But they both have great information that you can learn. You can learn from anybody, guys. Don't ever be too proud to learn from someone, ever. Um, so look at Randy's stuff for all the old school modifications and like some cool things that you can do, maybe to some of your new lures or maybe to some of these things that you break out of an antique box. Or look to some of these uh, guys that are on the very cutting edge and mimic what they're doing. Use JDM lures. Think outside the box, and what I would also recommend is downsize, um, not just baits, because big baits are still important, and medium-sized baits are still very important. It, I really think downsizing tackle in general, as far as like your rod and reels and your line diameter sizes in the winter time, especially or in clean water, is extremely important. Um, even in dirty water, it just you get a better action out of the bait. One, the line cuts differently in the current, too. So if everybody that runs down through an area is throwing their Alabama rig on 65-pound braid or they're throwing it on 25-pound monofilament, and you run down and you're throwing yours on 15-pound fluorocarbon, it's going to react and swing completely different in the current. So it's it's little things like that that can make a huge, huge difference on your catch rates at the end of the day. Anyway, guys, I really hope that this has been, you know, great for you. I, I'm, I'm excited to be kind of back in the swing of things with me guiding almost every day now. It's a little bit difficult for me to make this kind of content, but I really enjoy doing it for you. Now, one thing, if you enjoyed this video, this is actually a service that I provide through my charter service. So you can get on the website and you can actually book a private session just like the one that you just watched. So we went through and did a whole bunch of general things just now. We looked at a bunch of general patterns, general ways to catch these fish. You can also book me for a trip, not, not a trip, but book me for one of these uh, little seminars here. And what I can do is for an hour, you know, I can go over your home body of water. So what I usually do, so say if, if you're a guy and you want to do a map study on your home lake, it's some lake in Indiana, Lake of the Ozarks, or, you know, it's just, just wherever. I'll spend a few hours looking over that. I'll go through Google Earth. I'll go through the mapping and then I'll kind of draw together some areas that I think would be really good. And then um, some patterns that I think that you could run and it'll all be private. It'll be our own conversation. I'll record it just like I'm recording this now and I'll send it to you. You'll get a copy at the end of it. And it's something that you can keep and refer back to. And we can talk about different times of year. We can talk about different baits to use. Um, different individual waypoints, especially if it's on a lake that I'm aware of, you know, it's like I can give you individual spots. You know, I do that all the time for guys that are getting ready for a tournament on Chickamauga Lake. They'll call, they'll do one of these little webinar little things with me, and uh, I'll give them some really good locations for that tournament specifically where I think that they can get the job done. So it's just really neat. It's something that I think I can provide for you. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to no longer do you know, public map studies for everybody. I don't want you to think that. I'm not trying to hold back that information. I think one of my things that I've always kind of strive to do is to give out as much as I can um, information wise to you guys. So don't think that I'm trying to hold back and just give all this intel to uh, guys that are paying me to do it, guys that are booking charters and stuff like that. You're obviously going to get more if you book a charter, one, I'm going to be taking you to some of these areas, right? You're going to get to see firsthand experience. You're going to get to pick up the, the stuff. You're going to get me to watch you utilize these techniques and kind of critique what's going on and show you giving my two cents out on the water. The map studies that are individual, we're going to go through very detailed into these areas. And then you can ask these individual specific questions, which really comes in handy um, to help people learn. But I'm not going to ever stop um, just giving a lot of this information out. And I think that if 
you know, if nothing else happened, if you don't ever book a trip with me and you don't ever do a map study with me, if you take the information that you just watched in this video, you're still going to be very successful. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me, tuning in today. And if you made it to the end of the video, kudos to you. Remember to like and subscribe, share it to all your friends, unless you don't want them to, to know about this stuff. <laughs> but I hope this week finds you out on the water, guys, and I'll catch you there.